Mine is the migrating bird, winging far over remote oceans, ever pointing out the sea road of the black heron, the dark cloud in the sky of night. It is the road of the winds, coursed by the sea kings to unknown lands. Last week, we talked about the great distances and dangers of the Pacific Ocean, and how even today, it's hard to conceive of its vast empty spaces. But we also mentioned that to the voyagers of the Pacific, it didn't seem that empty at all. To them, it was full of landmarks. From the sun and moon, to stars, currents, clouds, debris, fish, and birds whose behavior could help them locate islands, even if they were previously unknown to humans. This discipline is called wayfinding, a term that encompasses both celestial navigation as well as knowledge of the natural world. It can not only determine direction, but also provide clues to the presence of land. And it was these techniques and advanced sailing technologies that allowed the Austronesian-speaking peoples and the cultures that evolved from them to settle maritime Southeast Asia and the Pacific. So who were the Austronesians? Well, to put it simply, the Austronesians are less an ethnicity and more of a language group. A series of people across Asia and the Pacific whose language is derived from an older Austronesian root language and who also have various cultural markers like petroglyphs, stilt houses, and boat building styles. Today, people speaking Austronesian languages can be found from Taiwan all the way to Hawaii and Sri Lanka. And according to the mainstream hypothesis, pre-Austronesians even settled Taiwan during the Neolithic period. Then, roughly between 3000 and 1500 BCE, those Austronesians made their first voyages out of Taiwan, south to the Philippines. And this kick-started a multi-millennia series of voyages, where the Austronesians and the cultures that followed them settled all of maritime Southeast Asia, then struck east into Melanesia and Micronesia. And then by about 1000 to 1200 CE, they'd arrived in the farthest flung parts of Polynesia, Hawaii, Rapa Nui, and New Zealand. On the way, they fragmented and changed, forming a large number of societies we've already talked about on this show, from the Champa kingdoms in our Angkor Wat series to the Javanese of Maja Pahit. Indeed, several waves of migration would overlap each other in Micronesia and Melanesia, creating a diverse and varied array of cultures. Some scholars think these migrations were due to political or religious conflicts, while others suggest that it was a measure to deal with overpopulation. When an island got too crowded, you just sent out ships to find and colonize another. But whatever the reason, they kept sailing east, a direction that was, incredibly, mostly against the prevailing winds. A feat that would have been much more difficult, if not for a revolutionary sail design known as the Crab Claw Sail. Crab Claws are a type of triangular sail that widens at the top, supported by two spars. And though the sails themselves would become modified at various places in the Pacific, the basic premise remains the same. It's an extremely high sail, with the largest part further off the water, where the wind is strongest and where it can catch gusts, even when between swells. They also have the advantage of spilling the wind when hit by a sudden gust, preventing damage in the middle of an ocean voyage. And while not as efficient or versatile as later sailing rigs, for its time, the Crab Claw was the top of its class. But concentrating all of that wind at the top of the sail meant the ship needed to be wide so it wouldn't capsize which is why all of the canoes using them were either double-hulled or had an outrigger. Voyaging canoes were generally double-hulled, giving the craft a wide, stable beam while still maximizing speed by keeping the two hulls narrow and with shallow draft. Helmsmen controlled the craft with a single steering oar in the rear, and because the hull is the same front and back, the craft can run in reverse just by turning the sails around. The canoe hulls themselves and the wide deck between them could carry large amounts of cargo, about 11,000 pounds in a 60-foot vessel, including crew, meaning it could stock enough food for long voyages, and this often included livestock such as pigs, chickens, domestic dogs, and food crops that could be planted upon their arrival on a new island. But okay, now you're wondering, and rightfully so, if we have an ocean-going canoe that can survive the unknown Pacific and run fast on the trade winds, how do you figure out where you're trying to go, especially if you're hoping to discover a new island? Enter wayfinding. As the chant that began this episode illustrates, the Pacific voyagers didn't consider the ocean to be an empty space. Instead, it was the road of the winds, a complex landscape of currents and gyres that could be read by touch and form a map when combined with the stars and prevailing wind patterns. At its simplest, it can mean orientating a canoe by landmarks. For instance, in Hawaii, the name of a particular channel between two of the islands literally translates to the road to Tahiti, because voyagers could sail to the channel, take bearings, and get a straight line path to Tahiti 2,600 miles away. 
Sailing in a straight line, however, is almost never possible due to weather conditions, but this would at least get a navigator off on the right heading. They would then have to use the natural world as a compass, orienting themselves by the rising and setting of the sun, the position of the moon, the planets, and particularly the stars. In the Northern Hemisphere, the chief orientation point was Polaris, otherwise known as the North Star, as it was the only one that wouldn't move. But Polaris is not visible in the Southern Hemisphere. So there, navigators would determine south via taking a mental measurement to a point slightly to the right of a constellation called the Southern Cross. Other stars could indicate waypoints as well. For example, at Hawaii's latitude, the star Arcturus lays directly overhead. Therefore, voyagers trying to map their way home to the islands would simply go to the point where the star was at its zenith. But of course, stars move depending on the time of year. So this meant that Pacific navigators could not simply memorize one position of the stars. They had to memorize how they appeared at every time of the year. Navigators would construct a sort of star map in their head, with the canoe in the center and the sky divided into quadrants around it. An absolutely monumental task that required years of study. In Micronesia, this memorization process might be done on star charts made of sticks and shells, discarded once a navigator went to sea. But in Polynesia, it was taught through chants, songs, and stories with mnemonic devices. And these mental maps could be extensive. For instance, when James Cook made his voyage from Tahiti to New Zealand, he took along with him the Tahitian navigator and priest Tupaya as a translator and guide. And when asked to draw a map of the Pacific, Tupaya crafted a chart that recorded 130 islands within a 2,000-mile radius of Tahiti. Navigators could also use the rocking of the canoe or a hand in the water to read the ocean's currents or wave patterns. And in certain conditions, the clouds could betray the presence of land, even if it lay over the horizon out of range of sight. And this is because clouds build up in specific formations around high mountainous islands, indicating their positions. While the lagoon center of a low-laying atoll could also reflect on the underside of a cloud layer. And then, of course, there was debris, such as floating plant matter or coconuts, when washed out to sea, that could also indicate an island nearby. But the best indicator was the wildlife. While certain types of fish become more abundant near land, it was the seabirds that provided the greatest clues. Pacific navigators understood the flight ranges of native birds, as well as their behaviors. Sighting a fisher bird streaking by in the morning, a navigator could be certain it had flown away from the shore to hunt. And if they turned their canoe toward where it came from, they had a pretty good chance they'd find land. Alternately, a navigator might see a bird flying with a fish in its beak. And in that case, it was definitely going back to shore to feed its young, so they could simply follow it. Indeed, some full voyages may have simply followed the path of migratory birds, reasoning that large groups of birds were not simply streaming out to commit suicide in the middle of the ocean, and that they were going somewhere. And the really cool thing to think about is if that's true, it would mean that the early Pacific explorers were the first to navigate the world using the Earth's electromagnetic field, though admittedly through some of our feathered friends. But what happened when these early explorers did find a new island? What kind of societies did they build, and how did they differ from place to place? Well, you're in luck, because next time, we break down the settlement of the Pacific step by step, talking about the wide variety of cultures the Austronesians spawned. From the island societies that built great structures and canals from stone, to the statues of Rapa Nui and the Maori of New Zealand, and the two waves of migration that colonized the most remote island on Earth, Hawaii. A big legendary thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Muscha, Dominic Valenciana, Gunnar Clovis, Kyle Murgatroyd, and O'Reels One.